So we want to move ahead to, from the perhaps simplest piece, to uh, perhaps the most complicated one. And this is the C major fugue. And this is a stretto fugue. So it's, it's based on uh, how a particular fugue subject is heard on top of itself, unlike a, most of the fugues, which are more like hollow subjects are, are used in succession with their own sort of uh, counter subjects <coughs> and other sidekicks that go along with them. There aren't any sidekicks in this uh, C major fugue except the, the theme itself as it's peered on top of itself. Now, what's uh, important about any fugue, but maybe especially a stretto fugue, is that the subject itself has to have something that really allows you to hear these relationships of things being heard on top of each other. And what makes this subject so great for that is that the various components of it have such distinctive personality. The character just is, is there in each of those little four colored parts that are given there. So that when you put them on top of each other, you can hear very clearly those relationships uh, uh, as one section, one particle uh, moves to the next. And Bach has discovered uh, several relationships that work harmonically uh, with these, uh, these relationships. So if, if you have the parent followed by the child, you can use the uh, one quarter note apart version. If I play C and follow it with G, that works just fine. So you can hear that, how those individual characters work against each other in this one quarter note offset relationship. Or we can use the two note two-quarter note offset relationship, which allows each little particle sort of to be you know, distinct in its own world. And we hear them against each other. And that works well if you follow the parent with the grandparent or the child with the parent. In other words, if I start with C and play F behind it, I can do it two notes apart. There's also a version of it that you can start uh, three quarter notes apart. Bach uses that one time uh, with uh, G followed by uh, B, so it's a relationship of a sixth. Now, just to give away the punchline of this entire piece, Bach found that there was one place, one, one way he could put all all four of the voices, this is a four voice fugue, together that would create a four voice stretto. So the stretto is the, is the fact that there, one fugue subject begins before the other one's finished. Here actually um, all four of them get in before the first one has finished. And it uses some of those relationships I've talked about. The soprano is followed by the alto. <laughs> But the tenor comes in, and it follows the uh, alto at the relationship of uh, two beats apart. And instead of being a uh, tonic to subdominant relationship, it's a relationship of a seventh. In other words, I'm starting on G here and following it with an A. Then we have finally have this uh, child to parent relationship. A to D. So, this, this is sort of the culminating point of the entire fugue, and here's what it sounds like. Um, 
so once you've discovered you've got all these great things you can do, the next thing is to try to figure out how you're going to, to put it all together. And uh, what's interesting is it's, it's hardly, I think, what you expect. Um, it, it's, at the beginning it is, because we hear, and I've, what I've done is to indicate the fugue subjects just by putting their uh, note that they start on in uh, a block letter. So it starts on C, and that's followed by its chow, G. And, uh, but not in stretto. These are all uh, free statements. So this first four statements are not uh, overlapped. We get to hear everything nice and clean. All four voices get to come in in a, an order of uh, C in the alto, G in the soprano, G in the tenor, C in the bass. Um, and that gives us a nice exposition of the key. Um, we're very comfortable in C. And our, our next uh, embarkation is on the, the world of stretto. And here the first stretto that we uh, exploit is the relationship of C to G, parent to child. And this section ends with one last statement in G, which is leading us into the world of the child, G. But, um, you know, this can happen. There's lots of statements already. We've had lots of C and G statements. We don't really feel like we've actually gone anywhere until this next section begins where G is followed by D. So G now becomes a parent in its own right, followed by its child. And that makes the entire piece start to lean into this uh, world of uh, sharp keys. So um, that looks like it's going to go into the key of G, except before very long, something really interesting happens. Um, one of my favorite pieces uh, songs is Yesterday. So this is, a, this is Bach's version of Yesterday. He's got the subject, but then the subject comes in in the tenor in E. So, yeah, I mean, it's the same feeling, you know? It's, it's the same key relationships, the same ascending F sharp and G sharp, those uh, ascending melodic pitches. And we get these wonderful diminished uh, fourth intervals that are created when you put very sharp stuff against very flat stuff. Um, this whole section, I'll just give you a little taste of this. In fact, here's what I want to do. I'm going to play the entire piece up to there. Uh, I've realized I'm not going to be able to play through all of these pieces for you. But um, I, I think hearing maybe up to here will give you a sense of how this entire structure works. Hearing the sort of deliberate presentation of C, G, G, C, and then hearing the beginning of the stretto quality with C followed by G, a uh, lone G appearance that sets up the next section, which is G followed by D, and this sort of sudden intrusion of uh, the E statement, which actually functions as the child of A. Uh, e is the, the dominant that's leading us to a cadence in A minor. Amen. 